Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for this uh, ESCO uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're really happy to have Zabi Jarabal, who's going to be talking about uh, real-time inflation inequality. Just a reminder to everyone, this event is being recorded. Uh, so bear that in mind when you're asking asking questions and stuff. This will be recorded and made available after the event. Um, Tara's going to talk for 40 minutes. There'll be 10 minutes of discussion from, from Chris Payne, who's joining us from the ONS. Uh, and then there'll be 10 minutes for put your own uh, questions. And if you'd like to ask a question in that uh, period at the end of the talk, uh, you can do so by uh, typing your question into the Q&A box, and then uh, we'll, we'll read them out to, to Xavier um, when the time comes. Uh, but that's enough for me. So um, uh, Xavier, take it away. Thanks, well, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. I'm glad to have a chance to present this work on inflation inequality in the US. Uh, so my talk will be focused on the US and then uh, I look forward to the comments from Chris and learning more about the UK data, which I think in a way we have more estimates in the, in the UK for inflation inequality compared to, to the US. So the motivation for this project is that we have more and more papers that document differences in inflation rates across income groups in the US, sometimes also in other countries. But I would say there are two challenges that uh, remain unaddressed in this literature, at least when we look at the US. The first is that a lot of the papers, including some of mine, use data sets that are proprietary, like scanner data. And so it's not quite comparable with the way the statistical agency in the US, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, computes inflation, the user to different sample frame, et cetera. The other part is that uh, for the papers that try to use publicly available data, um, they do so in a way that's not exactly consistent with the official methods used by the Bureau of Statistics, and so they're not consistent with the official aggregate consumer price index. So that's the first thing is that the estimates we have for inflation inequality don't fully really square with the aggregate CPI numbers when you average the group specific inflation rates. Sorry, Zave, can I just interrupt quickly? Yes. You happen to have headphones uh, available just because it's a bit of an, there's a bit of an echo. Um, um, you close the door. Thank Don't have headphones, but do, does this work better like this? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, when you when you get okay. close to the microphone, then it gets a bit echoey. But um, um, yes, thanks. So this is fine. That sounds much better. I don't know what you did, but okay, sounds... great. So if it if it degrades, let me know. Thanks. Um, and so the second uh, challenge is that these estimates of inflation inequality they're not available in real time. So every month we get a new inflation number from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but we don't get heterogeneity by groups. So the goal of this paper is very simple. It's just to have a database uh, to address these two challenges that every month we can get inflation inequality in the US in a way that's completely consistent with the aggregate CPI. So it's a very simple goal. Um, and the point is to build these high frequency uh, inflation distributions. And so I'll be able to do that today from 2002 to 2023. I'll focus quite a bit on the, at the beginning of the inflation burst uh, in the US because there are interesting heterogeneity patterns at that point in time. Um, so you'll see that the method is, is very simple. It, uh, it, it's gonna follow uh, what the CPI does, but in a way that can be disaggregated. And in a way, this is doing for inflation what others have done with distributional national accounts, Thomas Piketty and, and co-authors, where they produce data series that are consistent with macro aggregates, but can be disaggregated. So far, we don't have this for inflation now uh, with this paper, we do for the US. So it's combining diff different data sets. Uh, it's mostly two, it's the, the CPI price series, which uh, show up monthly, and then the expenditure shares that come from the consumer expenditure survey. So I'll discuss in a moment how this is combined. And then everything is going to follow the exact same uh, data construction steps as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, 
Um, so if you don't like the way the US Bureau of Labor Statistics computes inflation, the way they define the weights, how, the way they update them, this is all going to be uh, carried over in what I do. But in a way, it's, it's a strength because the point is to make everything uh, comparable. So I'll detail how uh, exactly that, that, that works. And then at the end, one disaggregation step so that we get, get everything by sociodemographic groups. Uh, using this approach, you can also compute indices at the level of a person rather than uh, a group of, uh, say, income or age. Uh, and uh, there's actually a lot of dispersion uh, across households within the same sociodemographic groups. So I'll, I'll briefly uh, show you that as well. So let me preview the results as of two points. The first is that uh, as in prior work, uh, I find with this new database, higher inflation rates for low income households uh, in the US over you know, the long run. So here looking at 2002 to 2020. But then the patterns change during the inflation burst. In, during the inflation burst in the US, it's not the low income who had the largest inflation rates, but rather the middle class. So I'm going to focus for today in the period between summer of 2020 to summer of 2022. Um, and so you have this, these patterns of uh, larger inflation for the middle class. And so that uh, contributes to a compression of uh, real wages so the low income catch up to the middle class. Uh, so that's already something that in the US you see with nominal wages, but that gets much faster if you account for these differences in inflation rates. So the compression of real wages is about twice as fast as the compression of uh, nominal wages. And the explanation is actually simple. Um, the, the difference in inflation rates uh, across income groups comes entirely from two product categories, uh, which is gas and new or used vehicles. The middle class tends to drive more, and so they get uh, more affected by these uh, larger uh, inflation rates for these product categories. So I'll, the rest of the talk, but uh, in 30 minutes, I'll first describe the methodology, then the results. And then uh, if there's time left, I'll um, touch briefly on a different paper where we have a way to compute inflation rates across income groups that takes into account non-methodicities in a way that's very flexible, while everything that comes before is saying we're going to view as homothetic the preferences of each income group. So they're allowed to have differences but between them, but then within each group, the methodology assumes that uh, everyone has homothetic preferences. So um, the other paper shows that you can correct that, and actually that doesn't make much of a difference. So there's time. I'll, I'll briefly touch on some of the key points of that other paper. So let me describe how uh, the BLS builds uh, inflation rates. So first, the, the data sources. So first, you have um, a database that gives expenditure shares across the product categories used to measure prices. And so the, the categories used to measure prices are, are called ELI. That means entry-level item. Um, and uh, they have a consumer expenditure survey, the CEX that uh, uses different categories called the UCCs, uh, universal classification codes. Um, but then they have a crosswalk. And so starting from the CX expenditure survey, they go to the AI product categories and they build these expenditure shares, which, which they call relative importance weights. And so that they make public for um, the recent years. And so we can use this to check uh, that we handle the microdata in the survey correctly, that we can correctly match these uh, relative importance weights. And the way they do it is all for the aggregates, while I will disaggregate this. So th that's one component that's gonna be useful, mostly as a benchmark. Uh, number two is the monthly uh, price changes across these categories called the ELIs. And so this is available online. It's identical to the official CPI. It's missing for a few items that, uh, the BLS doesn't want to publish because they say it's uh, samples are too small. They, they don't view uh, the data as super reliable. So they use them internally, but they don't put it online. So for this series, I will need to impute when there is, for example, one month missing. Um, but you will see that despite this step, it's uh, I can match the aggregate CPI very, very closely. 
And then the final component, which in a way is the most important one, is from the consumer insurance expenditure survey, we have all these uh, sociodemographic characteristics for each respondent that we observe for each, each part. And so then we can build in this way uh, expenditure shares that vary across groups. So then a big uh, endeavor, although it's conceptually simple, it just takes a lot of uh, manual work, is to link the data set from the CEX, the survey, to the CPI, the ELI product categories, because this crosswalk actually isn't public. The, the BLS doesn't make it public except for the most recent years. And so going back in time, we have to build this crosswalk. Um, and that takes quite a bit of time because the, the classifications change. And so the hope of the project is just that um, you know, now no one else needs to uh, go through that uh, Cumbersome process. Uh, we can make all the crosswalks available for all the years, and then you have uh, a data series that's consistent with the official numbers. But also, you can do much more because you have uh, all the heterogeneity that uh, that you can study. So the data we cover January two thousand two to May twenty twenty three. Uh, it's easy to add the data now up to uh, December twenty twenty three, but that's uh, that's not done. So now let me a bit more let me be precise about the way the BLS builds expenditure shares and uh, how they update them over time and exactly what price index they they built. And I'll do the same, and you'll see it will just be with one disaggregation. Step. So they start from these expenditure shares, the aggregate shares, and they call them relative importance weights. Um, and they do the following: they say, "Well, this is December." Um, so every other year, say December 2021, is, is one of those years where they update the, the weights using data. They say, this is December 2021. Let me get the consumer expenditure survey data from the past two years. Um, so I sum all the expenditure across all these UCCs for the past two years. And then I use my crosswalk from UCCs to the BLS categories that are called ELIs. Uh, and, uh, and then in this way, I get aggregate expenditure shares um, for December 2021, which effectively uses data from 2019 to 2021. And then for the two years that follow, they will update the weights month to month, but not using actual data. They will instead use an assumption about the substitution behavior of um, consumers. And so this is obtained from a CS price index with an elasticity of substitution of zero, which is the ANTF index. So the, the form, they just tell you directly how you can think of it with, with the utility function, but just want to see what they, what they do. Basically, they, they have these baseline weights, the omega I zero for each category I, and then zero is December. And then, uh, so we go in January, and so then we're going to rescale all the uh, expenditure shares by a inflation rate PIT or PI zero. And so the categories that have more inflation are going to get more weight. Um, and so you can uh, then reinterpret this as this is CS price index with an substitution of zero. So it's a fairly uh, extreme case, arguably, Leontian, but that's the one that they use. So I'm just going to stick uh, with that. Instead, that I'm going to change these omega weights so that these things vary by groups. And then the, the price changes on the other hand will remain identical to what the BLS does. So the price changes are not gonna be person specific or group specific, while in principle, maybe they, they should be. So the reweighting approach I described on this slide. Um, and remember the goal is that everything remains uh, consistent with macro aggregates, but we have group specific price indices. So the idea is to keep the official BLS relative importance weights to be like fully consistent with that. So there's the, the macro uh, benchmark, but distribute these relative importance weights across socio-demographic groups. So I'll describe the, the steps. Uh, the first step is to sort of make sure that I use the, the consumer expenditure survey data in the, in the right way, so starting from the CX, and uh, there's many cleaning choices that you have to make, it's, as always, in survey data. Uh, but the, the Bureau of Statistics makes available some uh, summary tables, which 
sort of shows implicitly the way they clean the data. Um, and so I can check that the, the group specific expenditure summary statistics that I get match the ones that they uh, make public because uh, they make this public in, in December of every other year. So that is sort of made, makes sure that I handle the, the CX the same way as uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Number two is to use the crosswalk that uh, I mentioned is a bit cumbersome to build when you go to the earlier years, but once you have it, you can use the crosswalk to go from the categories from the consumer expenditure survey to the price categories. UCC is CX, ELI is CPI. And then uh, once we have that, then it's easy for each ELI, you can compute the share of sales that goes to each uh, type of sociodemographic group. So then we have these um, these shares from, um, from for, for each item, we know this is mostly sold to low income group, this is mostly sold to a high income group. So then you can distribute the ELI relative importance weights so there I can start uh, from the official uh, relative importance weight of the of the CPI. I can also rebuild it from scratch, but to be exactly consistent, I just start from the official relative importance weight. Um, and then from that, we obtain expenditure shares for uh, for each group, which here I'm going to denote SI0G. And so this is the same as the omega I0G on, on the slide, except that here it was for the aggregate, and now it's for each uh, group indexed by G. So this, remember, is for December, and this uses the data from the past two years. And from then onward, I do the same thing as uh, DLS does. Every month afterwards for the following two years, I update the shares using the same formula as they do, so it's still interpreted as the on-chain. Um, then in your study robustness by uh, changing the LSU substitution, that's not something that uh, I've done yet, but that's something that's fairly uh, easy to, to do. Um, and then finally, you can just compute the price index uh, with these expenditure shares. So it's a uh, last pairs index, just like what the BLS does. So hopefully that shows very clearly where all the steps are. Um, and of course, as I previewed, any limitation for the CPI methodology still applies. You may not like the Leontief assumption. Uh, you may not like the way housing is handled uh, because housing is also an investment good. But here, I don't have anything to say. The goal is to stay close to CPI. And then, of course, one limitation is that there is no heterogeneity across groups within product categories, so which, again, are called ELIs. Uh, all groups experience the same ELI level price change. In fact, when you work with scanner data, you see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in inflation, even within categories. Um, so that's something that this method cannot uh, speak to. So it's one good limitation to, uh, to keep in mind. But it's still interesting to see what we obtain uh, just with the between uh, product component. There's about 250 ELI categories. So the first thing uh, is to check that the method that I proposed uh, tracks the published CPI very closely. And so indeed it does. Um, this is for the recent period. You can also show this for the, for the, full, uh, for the full period. We'll go back to 2002, but the published CPI and um, the reconstructed one uh, are almost uh, indistinguishable on this figure. So then let's go the results. So um, first, uh, focusing on the long run trends from 2002 to recent years, and then focusing specifically on the inflation burst uh, in the US. So this is the result for inflation rates by income percentiles, so where here I'm going to show you the results for top 5%, uh, 75th percentile, median, quarter and then the bottom five percent. So you see overall you start from 2002, uh, inflation rate was about 70%, but it's only about 65% for high income groups. And it's closer to 78% for people at the bottom of the income distribution. So it's quite a, a substantial uh, gap. And you see that it's something that grows slowly over time. Uh, when you look at it with this time scale, it's not like there's one moment that strikes you as the moment where things diverge. So like they diverge and then reconverge. Yeah, there's this slow 
divergence. Um, and I have some other work uh, trying to explain this, these trends. And if, if there are questions at the end, we can, uh, we can talk about it. But here, the novelty is just that this is, uh, I think, the first series that's really uh, fully consistent with the BLS method and that you can, uh, can update every month at, uh, at very little cost. Uh, an easier way to appreciate the patterns is uh, to just focus on cumulative inflation from January 2002 to recent periods, so here May 2023. And this graph here is plotting the inflation rate for each household income percentile. And so you see that there's about a 15 percentage point difference um, across the income distribution. And so that matters quite a bit if uh, go back to that in a minute, but if you want to measure things like real income growth by group or poverty rates, this type of adjustment is actually uh, really meaningful. Uh, but it's not just about income. Maybe there are also interesting differences by age groups. So here's a graph where you have younger households between 25 and 34, and then older households, including 75 and above. And so looking at the long run here, the older groups actually tend to have uh, higher inflation. And the dispersion is also uh, meaningful. So over that period of 20 years, you get uh, a dispersion of about 10 percentage points. It's quite uh, monotonic. So it's uh, the older groups get higher uh, inflation. And so in the United States, uh, it's also uh, useful to look at differences by ethnic groups. And um, so here you have white Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans. And so here actually, um, there is less of a difference, which um, is interesting given that we know there are substantial uh, income differences between these groups. Um, but here actually, it turns out that uh, the difference is relatively small, it's only a few percentage points. And um, you can also look, compare rural and urban households. Um, if you look at very long run, it's not too different. Uh, you'll see that uh, in the more recent period, there are actually stronger uh, differences that, uh, that appear. Um, and so let's just say a word on uh, the comparison to prior work. So everything I showed is actually very consistent with earlier work. So um, some of what I did before that wasn't consistent fully with the, the CPI methodology, the overall numbers were quite similar. So you have an inflation rate that's about 40 basis points lower on average per year for the top income quintile compared to the bottom income quintile. Uh, and that work was also showing that if you get micro data like scanner data, actually you, you get stronger differences. So in principle, you would want to do this in all sectors, find micro data in all sectors, but that's quite, uh, quite difficult to get. With scanner data, you can also do adjustments for product variety, and then you get uh, an even larger uh, difference because product variety increases faster in categories that, uh, that sell to the rich. There's also a paper using internal BLS data sets um, that uh, finds similar orders of magnitudes by Click and Stockburger. Um, and uh, just wanted to, to mention that this magnitudes are substantial uh, in terms of uh, the application for the measurement of, uh, of real income growth. So there's one graph here that was uh, a policy paper where we were comparing the, the numbers obtained with the official CPI and then the metric adjusting for inflation inequality, here focusing on 2004 to 2018. And so you see here that, for example, at the bottom of the income distribution with the official metric, incomes are stagnant. With the corrected metric, higher inflation rate at the bottom, you get actually a fall in real income of about uh, 7%. If you look at poverty rates, um, you have about 3 million more people in poverty in 2018 uh, when once you make these adjustments starting from 2004. So these are things that uh, I will redo with the with the measure from the new uh, the new data set, but I think the orders of magnitude will be uh, will be quite similar. Now let's focus more on the short run. So what happened during the recent period of high inflation? Uh, so first, uh, just to contextualize. Um, so here I'm going to stop in, in May uh, 2022. I, I will then uh, extend this. Um, 
And so here the overall CPI in blue with the with the dots, uh, you see in about uh, two years, you have 17% inflation. A lot of this comes from gas and vehicles. If you exclude these two categories, uh, inflation now falls to 13% cumulatively over the two years. So then we, we can you know, go back to this question of heterogeneity by inflation, uh, but it's really inflation by income groups. Uh, so this is similar type of graph compared to before, except that now I compare inflation rates by household income percentile over a much shorter period from May 2020 to May uh, 2022, which is a, the fastest period of uh, increase in inflation in the US. And you now have this uh, inverse U-shaped pattern so you see that inflation is around 13.5% you know, at the bottom and then uh, closer to 15.5% uh, at the middle of the income distribution and it falls back to 14% at the top. And these differences are uh, interesting to compare to uh, changes in wages. So um, one summary number to, to, to keep from this is say a 2 percentage point cumulative gap between the bottom all the top of the income distribution and the middle. And that's a meaningful difference when you compare that to estimates of changes in nominal wage inequality during the same period. So a paper by uh, Blanchet, Says, and Zuckman, they find that nominal wage growth was about two to three percentage point higher at the bottom and at the top of the income distribution compared to the middle. So the middle was sort of stagnating. And here, what I find is that this is amplified by the, um, the fact that inflation rates vary. And so the compression of real wages is about twice the compression that we've been at the bottom. Um, and there's actually a uh, more dispersion if you compare middle class to the top, but look at the bottom, it's so twice as fast compression. Low income catch up twice as fast to the middle class once you include inflation inequality. So then the question is to understand what drives this difference in. Uh, inflation rates across uh, income groups during this period. And the answer is very simple. You just withdraw two categories, gas and vehicles, and you get something very flat. If anything, it's actually now slightly upward sloping, but a small difference of 0.5 percentage point between the bottom and the top of the income distribution. And so gas and vehicles are, are, are larger expenditure shares for the middle class. And we had, of course, very large inflation rates for these categories during this period. Uh, so that was for income. And then it's also useful to um, document what happens to um, other, you know, other types of groups. So if we compare rural and urban here, the rural categories have um, inflation rates that are quite a bit higher. Again, it's related to gas and vehicles. You need a car uh, to live uh, outside of the city. By age group, interestingly, the patterns are flipped compared to you know, what I said earlier, if you look at the past 20 years, the old groups, older groups had the higher inflation rates. Here it's actually flipped. Um, here the group over 75 has 15% uh, cumulative inflation during the period, and uh, the younger groups are like 18%. Uh, by race, the the difference are the differences exist. Um, but um, so I, you know, they, as I said, it was a longer, and we, they were less. Uh, they were less visible uh, here. Actually, in that period, they're kind of large compared to the income differences. And um, so, for example, here Asians have inflation rate of sixteen percent, and African Americans closer to seventeen point five percent. Security. So I think this shows that, of course, depending on the period, depending on the type of shock, different groups are going to be affected differently. And so that's why it's useful to keep track of things. Uh, in real time to the extent uh, possible. And then briefly, uh, without going too much into the methodology, uh, the things we did I did before at the level of social demographic groups can be done at the level of uh, households as well. So you, now the level of observations and individuals, so you have the expenditure shares. Um, the consumer expenditure survey follows people only for a year. So, um, and I'm going to follow this, the same household for several periods and make statements about their cumulative inflation rate. But just looking at uh, people, uh, tracking them for, for a year, you can build these uh, household level inflation rates. And then you can 
you can show that distribution. And so this graph here does it. So I'm reporting different moments, the 10th percentile, the median, the 90th percentile of the monthly inflation rate that's annualized. So, for example, here it says in July 2020, the median household in the US had an inflation rate of 2.5%, uh, but 10% of households had an inflation rate above 5%, and then another 10% had an inflation rate below 1.5%. So, it gives you a sense of this broad dispersion. And, um, and then this uh, gets amplified as uh, accumulates uh, inflation rates here uh, over time. Um, so that's interesting to keep in mind that a lot of the dispersion is within household groups. That's something that's been seen in you know, other contexts as well. For example, theater has a very interesting paper on uh, spending on imported goods, which often gets cheaper over time and showing that uh, import shares are very heterogeneous even within income groups or within age groups. So then since I have about five to uh, 10 minutes left, I wanted to say a word on a related paper that's more of a theoretical paper. So what I showed so far is very simple data exercise. One thing that you maybe were uh, displeased with is that uh, it's all about differences across groups and in particular income groups. But once I've defined a group, I treat all the household within a group as, as identical because I use standard type of homothetic price index like like CS with the low elasticity of substitution. Um, and so the question is how we should proceed differently when uh, actually preferences change, when um, when people's incomes change. Like, well, how does that change the calculation? So we have this paper with Daniel Lashkari that's forthcoming in the QJ in February, where we have a method to have a price index that's very general and um, actually pretty minor data requirements and you can get uh, inflation rates that uh, you can compute inflation rates without doing anything uh, strange about saying oh, these groups have actually homothetic preferences even though between groups we allow for large differences so the um, method of the paper is going to be hard to fully describe in, in nine minutes but i want to just describe the broad idea in case you're interested in using the method or um, looking more into the paper so the idea is to define welfare as um, expenditure under constant prices in, in some base period. So we're going to always uh, refer to that to measure changes in welfare. That's what we normally do, except that with homothetic preferences, the choice of the base period doesn't matter. With these non-homothetic preferences, it's, it will matter which period you take as base. So maybe that's the main point I'll uh, try to convey if uh, if I have time. There will be a simple correction for the effect of the non statistic. So compared to the standard price index, uh, here what we'll show is that you need to correct the standard price index by some number that uh, shows how inflation changes with real consumption. So you know, I showed you earlier a graph like this the relation between income and the price index. And so effectively the correction has to do with the slope of this graph. And the intuition is relatively simple, is that if, if you become richer and uh, if inflation is, is lower for people who are richer, then as you become richer, you can increase your utility more because your preferences were shifting towards goods where inflation is actually lower. So that's, so the intuition why uh, things need to be corrected. Um, and so then we have a, an algorithm that you can implement with standard data, you just need the price changes and then uh, the expenditure shares. Um, and so when we do this, uh, first we, we have, we show that there's inflation inequality in the US with higher inflation for low income groups for a very long period, even going back to 1950. Um, and that, then our statistic correction matters for um, some of the key headline numbers. So for example, if you measure growth between 1955 and 2019 in the US under the standard approach, you get growth of 275%. With the normal statistic correction, using 2019 prices as base, 
growth is actually lower, 236%. Um, and the reason is that we were underestimating uh, 1955 uh, GDP. So let me try to explain the intuition for this, um, given that time is limited. So if you pick 2019 as your base prices, which means that you know, we're looking at the prices around us and we have a sense of what it means to make $10,000 or $100,000. And so take these prices, this environment as base. And then we go back in the past and we want to measure welfare uh, in the past using the 2019 price distribution and expenditure distribution as our notion to express welfare. What, what happens is that in the when you go in the past, uh, people were poor. Um, and in fact, the, the the inflation rates in the data show that um, the price of necessities was actually relatively cheaper. That's just what we see in the in the data. So on average, uh, necessities were actually relatively cheaper in the past. And so that means that in 1955, people were poor, but at the same time, the goods that they like more, because now they're poor, they like necessities, it turned out that these necessities were relatively cheaper. And so we need to account for that. And so in fact, that means we were underestimating 1955 GDP. And so uh, we were overestimating uh, both. If you think about uh, this from the point of view of 1955 GDP, so if you change the, the base period, um, actually you will uh, you will find something a bit different because the, the, the reference point really matters. So I don't know if I'll have time to explain this clearly, but I'll just tell you uh, the intuition and we can talk more after. If you, if you say, okay, I started in 1955, then going forward, um, people get richer. And also as they get richer, actually the relative price of the luxuries falls because inflation for the rich is lower. So now it works the other way. They get richer and the stuff that they like more luxuries actually uh, also gets cheaper. So actually growth is even faster than you thought. So the choice of the base period is fundamental because uh, by definition, it will, flip, it will flip the ordering of the bias in growth as long as there is some kind of inflation inequality. So inflation rates being systematically different for luxuries or necessities. Um, but I think the bottom line here is that you can make these corrections um, with available data. It's a relatively simple algorithm. And the, the corrections matter, but they matter over the, at least in what we've seen, they matter over the very long run, unless you have like super large inflation rates. So if you do an, an analysis over five years or even 10 years, pragmatically, you might not need to, um, to adjust for these things. So yeah, we, can, we can go back to the algorithm at some point if you are uh, interested. So just to conclude, the main uh, new thing I want to present today just shows a simple method to produce estimates of inflation equality in real time in the US. We see that longer patterns, short run patterns can be quite different. Um, you can augment this type of analysis with the uh, non-parametric tools to really account for non-metricities seriously. Uh, and so this you know, type of data might be interesting uh, if we think about monetary policy or sort of fiscal policy, but especially monetary policy, distributional effects of inflation. Um, and so that's why I think it's useful to have this type of data for many countries. And uh, I look forward to hear Chris. I think Chris will also talk about the data we have and the uh, the presence is that the ONS has already built uh, for the UK by by groups. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Xavier. Um, so, Chris, have you got? Uh... Oh, sorry, stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Let me just share my slides. Okay. Hopefully, you can see my screen. But please let me know if you can't. All looks good. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, I was just going to reflect on some of the results that Xavier shared with us um, and contrast those with some of the, the findings that we found in the UK as well, actually. Um, so just to start with, by way of a summary, um, you know, it's a really interesting topic and there's some really interesting results in, in Xavier's presentation. And um, you know, I think it's clear that it's possible to produce subgroup inflation rates um, using official data that are consistent with the official metric. 
And the results show quite clearly that different types of households do experience very different rates of inflation. And that makes this a really important topic, I think. Um, and the reason that we see different inflation rates for different households comes from the fact that different households have different baskets. So different types of households will spend their budget in different ways. You know, perhaps lower income households are more constrained to purchasing essentials. And so the inflation rates of those goods and services will impact lower income households more. Um, and as it happens, we've seen quite similar patterns in the UK, which hopefully sort of corroborate some of Xavier's findings. So I'm just going to step through those quite quickly now. So these are from our household cost indices publications. This is actually a new quarterly publication that we launched just before Christmas, but they have been in development for a while. Um, they are not consistent with our CPI and CPIH. Um, I will cover that in more detail in a few slides time, but the reason we don't choose to make them consistent is because we want to try and show a bit more how households are experiencing inflation. So here we have uh, chained indices by income decile. So this shows the cumulative growth back in time. Um, we don't go quite as far back as Xavier did. So these are referenced to 2007 equals 100. But you can see quite a clear trend in the data, which is a very similar trend to what we just saw, whereby the higher income households, um, as represented by deciles 9, 10, for example, have the lower rates of inflation, whereas the lower income households have the higher rates of inflation over, over this period. And then moving on now to look at the shorter run picture. So this, these are annual inflation rates. So we're looking now at, at the price levels compared with the same month in the previous year. And you can see since January 2020, there's been a little bit of variation. So we've got a period from roughly the middle of 2020-21 to the middle of 2022, where higher income households actually had a slightly higher rate of inflation. Um, and that relationship reversed in May 2022, when actually lower income households started to experience a higher rate of inflation. Um, so th for the period where higher income households had the highest rate, that was due to motor fuels, used car prices, new car prices. So similar effects to, to what Xavier described in his presentation. And obviously um, they reflect a bigger proportion of the budget for higher income households. But as we started to see increased inflation feed through from food, um, household energy bills, those, those kind of um, non-discretionary expenditures, I guess, they reflect a bigger proportion of low income households budgets. And so that's pushed their inflation rates higher. On this next slide, we've just tried to recreate one of the charts from Xavier's presentation, where we looked at the um, inflation rate by percentile between May 2020 and May 2022. And in the US data, we saw this sort of slight humping effect where the, the middle classes had the, the higher rate. Um, we only have decile data here, so just sort of plotted the 10 deciles that we have, but actually we see a slightly different picture. Um, so over that period, we see quite a clear linear trend with lower income households having the higher rate and higher income households having the lower rate. It's also worth pointing out here, I think on Xavier's chart, we had a, a distribution of sort of about four percentage points between the, the top end and the bottom end, whereas our scale is much smaller here. So we've got one 1 1.6 percentage points um, across the scale of the chart. So this next table just sets out how our household cost indices actually differ from CPIH and CPI. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing in detail because there isn't time, but some key points to pick out. So we use a democratic weighting structure for the HCIs rather than a plutocratic weighting structure, which is what's used in CPI and CPIH and also for the US data, I believe. Um, essentially, plutocratic weights look at the total share of household spending in the UK. Whereas the idea behind a democratic weight is you calculate the average household's share of expenditure. Um, so you're giving every household equal weight, essentially. The way that we construct our subgroup weights is very similar to what Xavier's done. So the CPI and CPIH are based on national accounts expenditure. Um, those underpin the weights. So we take those expenditures and we basically take our living costs and food survey, which is our consumer expenditure survey, and we um, 
calculate the proportions of expenditure for different subgroups and we scale those up to match national accounts totals. The middle section of this table just describes where the differences in scope are between CPI and HCIs. Um, it's just really to highlight that there are differences in scope, but probably the, the biggest difference to draw your attention to is the treatment of owner-occupied housing. So owner-occupied housing costs are excluded um, from CPI and they're included on the basis of an equivalent rent in CPI H. But for the HCIs, because we're trying to capture households experience, we include things like mortgage interest to measure it instead. Um, and then the final row on the table just shows the different data that we produce on a CPI basis and on a HCI basis. So you can see the range of subgroups that we produce are slightly different to what Xavier has presented. So we have income breakdowns, but we also produce tenure type splits, retirement status, and family size. I just wanted to finish up with some reflections on subgroup estimates and, and how we interpret them in some areas to perhaps be careful with interpretation. So firstly, when we're thinking about different types of groups, um, I think age is quite distinct in that households will necessarily move through the age bands over time. So, for example, if we're looking at inflation over a 20 year period and we're looking at, say, the 25 to 34 age group, the households in that band at the start of the period will not be the same households that are in that band at the end of the period. So households will move through the age bands over the period that we're looking at. That's probably also true of a lot of other subgroups. So you would expect, for example, that households will move up through the income deciles over time, but it's not a necessary condition. And you might expect perhaps that for lower income households, it's harder to move up through the income deciles than, than for wealthier households. The second point here, I just wanted to draw out a distinction between household level subgroups and person level subgroups, which I think is quite important when we're thinking about interpretation. So in terms of expenditure, household is a fairly well-defined unit. We can look at the expenditures that a household makes and, and sort of categorize them fairly easily. But I think it's it's slightly less well-defined when we're talking about person level characteristics. So for example, a household will pay rent as a whole. It will pay energy bills as a whole. So if you're thinking about person level characteristics, you've got to be able to distribute that out. But then some expenditures that a household will make um, may not, it may not be fair to distribute those out in the same way. So if you think about something like tobacco consumption, it may be that one person in the household is a smoker. That's probably more likely to be an older person. And so that expenditure doesn't sort of apply equally to everyone in the household um, and not everyone in the household will benefit from that. So I think if we're breaking household expenditures down into subgroups, we've got to sort of think carefully about those things. Um, and you know, some subgroups that we're looking at refer to the household as a whole. So if we're talking about the location, so whether they're urban or rural, the household income, but some of them will refer to a person like race or age. And it's possible to have mixed characteristics within a household. So you can have different races within a household. You probably do have different age bands within a household. Um, I'm going to skip to the last slide, just in the interests of time. Um, so I think sur su um, survey sample sizes are important to think about as well. So sample sizes can be a problem. And if we if we start breaking the survey down into smaller subgroups, so if we think about income deciles, for example, we're splitting our survey down into to 10 equal parts, then you have smaller sample sizes and that can cause problems. And that will depend on the area of the basket that you're looking at as well. So for example, um, in food, we tend to see quite good response. So it's fairly straightforward to get reliable estimates, but there are other areas where this isn't the case, for example. So health is an area of spending where we see quite low response. Um, and the, the implication there is that you can be basing your proportions on a very small number of reporting households. So that can lead to, to problems as well. We have an approach with our UK data, which we refer to as the proxy methodology, whereby we assess whether we have a sufficient sample size and whether we're scaling that sample up to a very a much bigger number. Because what we're trying to avoid is the situation where we're imputing very large expenditures to any given household. What the proxy methodology does is it basically says if there's low response at this level of the hierarchy, at the lowest stage of the COICOP aggregation structure, then you go up a level in the aggregation structure and you look at the distribution there, and that is the spending distribution that you impute at the lower level. So it's a helpful way of dealing with some of the volatility that you can see in uh, the survey data. 
Um, I might stop there as I've run out of time, but thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, uh, both of you. That was really interesting. I think it's really interesting to see how when you kind of bring the analysis of inflation inequality and wage inequality together, it really helps you understand the sort of long run patterns and trends in long run and short run trends in inequality a lot better. And um, I think one thing that I hope to see much more of in the future is that we don't do these separate analysis constantly, you know, one time looking at wage inequality and another time looking at inflation inequality and, and don't think at the same time simultaneously what this means for people's living standards. Um, uh, so now's the time for Q&A. So if you've got a question, uh, if you could put it in the box, um, I might uh, abuse my position as chair. Uh, this is almost a question for both of you. So while I was watching uh, Xavier's uh, presentation, I was furiously Googling the, um, the ONS's uh, own uh, CPIH consistent uh, measures of inflation rate by household income groups. Um, and uh, the patterns in those sort of suggest there's very little inequality across income groups um, over the 15 or so years. Uh, and that's obviously a bit different from, from the household cost indices that Chris was showing. And I suspect, and you alluded to this, is this may have something to do with the treatment of owner-occupied housing costs. Um, um, but um, there's a sort of well, almost uh, quite a fascinating issue is that, you know, in the US, you might have seen this long run trend where the poor had higher inflation rates. If you do something comparable in the UK and uh, using the CPI methodology, you don't see that same pattern. Um, and um, I'd, I'd like to kind of throw that out there as, as, as a comment for either of you, um, if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the UK data enough, so I think I'll turn to Chris, but I guess I'm struck that it, it seems like the choice of the method matters a lot, because what Chris showed was clear, it looked actually quite similar to the US pattern, as Chris pointed out. Yeah, so I think um, we, we have got some CPIH consistent subgroup data which you found Peter and um, I think that runs up to the end of 2022 um, and actually that was just at the sort of start of the period where we started to see some of the really big divergences um, in inflation rates um, over 2023 so it is possible that if we had continued the CPIH subgroup series we may have seen some of those big divergences occurring there as well I think the divergence that we saw over 2023 was largely driven by food and by energy prices. Um, so I might expect to see a similar sort of effect feeding through into CPIH, which also has an owner-occupied housing component, it's just on a different basis. I think what's what's interesting actually is that over the last few months that the, the inflation rates have come back together in the HCIs for high and low income households. And that's an offsetting effect where energy bills are still making a, a big contribution for uh, low income households, but that's offset by the increase in mortgage interest payments for higher income households. And so we are starting to see that effect come through now, which you might not have seen in the CPH subgroup data. I see. That's interesting. That's, yeah, uh, I guess it's a bit the, because uh, yeah, I guess from your graph, there was something going on throughout the 2010, it seems, but maybe it's just a bad enough. When you accumulate, as opposed to just looking at inflation rates, Annually, then it starts becoming more visible. Or I don't know if your what you present today has more detailed product categories than than the other method. But uh, yeah, it's super interesting to see that. Uh, that yeah, we're going to get to the bottom of this. But uh, happy to discuss more. And we have two questions in the chat. I don't know if we. Yes. Um, yeah. um, um, uh, yeah. So um, I'll just I'll just read them out for video. So the first question came from Anthony Savaga. Uh, so he asks, have you thought about the relationship between groups and price duration as a proxy for uh, uncertainty? Um, and then Jill Leyland asks, or if you can, if you'd like to deal with that question. And, and the second question, Jill Leyland asks, um, she thanks you for the very interesting presentation. Have you been able to compare the experimental household cost indices that the BLS is working on and are similar to the ONS household uh, cost indices? So the second question, I don't have information. That's a good thing to think about. On the first one, I'm not sure I fully understood the, 
what was meant by price duration and uh, proxy for uncertainty. So maybe yes. Anthony can clarify, or, or maybe it's clear to Chris or, or Peter. Uh, Anthony, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Do you, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, oh, well, we exactly. Yeah, it was to do with frequency of price changes across um, groups. So at the moment, you're really focusing on levels. So uh, let's yeah. say a, a high uh, income group is facing lower levels was inflation but it could also be that it's facing um fewer changes in prices so um you know lower frequency price changes which seems to be you know an important part of what's going on at the moment it's not just that you know we all know prices are going up it's where is that price change coming from is it the gas bill is it the um you know the groceries or, or whatever so is that something you've thought at all about Dur duration of price changes across so, groups and of course yeah. that relates back to lots sticky price literature and stuff yeah so the thing i had done in another paper is just to look at the relationship between stickiness and income groups and um okay, use, yeah. yeah so just to get it let them think to maybe try to get it right um so, so there are differences so the the that i might not get i need to check the paper uh the one of the groups you know the, the lower income groups i think are less ex Oh, they're, they're, yeah, that's it. So the low, low income groups tend to buy from more sticky prices. I mean, typically things like gas, would be, motor fuel would be would be less sticky. So and so that has that can have implications for monetary policy. You can put this in a model, and that matters a bit because low income groups have different marginal provinces to consume, and so they're going to be more exposed to uh, or. or if, if inflation rises, they're going to be more exposed to the rise in inflation because they have these more flexible prices. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that, I agree that's an interesting line of, uh, of inquiry. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, unless there are um, further questions, oh, uh, no, there's... Thank you from, from Anthony. Um, I guess it would be nice to kind of close with, um, you know, some of the sort of policy implications either for, you know, monetary policy or for uh, national statistical offices, you know, something we can take away. Um, if you have a final thought on that. I mean, I'd say two things. Like one is if we think about monetary policy, fiscal policy. You know, we have now we have more and more models where you have heterogeneity in households. It's, and trying to say the NPCs. And so this matters for the models we use, and eventually that feeds, feeds into the policy decision process. But so far, inflation inequality is not front and center in this. And so I think that's one agenda that's still, I think, more on the academics at this stage. How do you bring this into the standard models we use to think about monetary policy, fiscal policy? So that's, I think, that's an interesting agenda. But then a more concrete thing is um, for everything that has to do with indexation, different countries do things differently. But for example, in the US, they do not index the poverty line or tax rate or transfers like food stamps using price indices that are relevant for the population that uh, it is, is eligible uh, to these programs. But we have all the data and we can do it in a way that's very disciplined. That's the point of using this publicly available data and exactly the same procedures. You're not doing your own thing by getting standard data from a private provider. All the private, all the public thing, same method. And it makes a big difference. So one number is in the US, you have about 30 million people who are eligible for Medicaid uh, with the corrected uh, number since they have higher inflation rate at the bottom. More people are in poverty, more people should be eligible. So about 4 million people more that should be eligible to this, uh, uh, to this Medicaid program. Okay, thanks very much. And that's time. Uh, so uh, thanks both to Xavier, our presenter, and Chris, our discussant, and for yeah. all of you coming. Thanks so much to Chris for a great discussion. I learned a lot. And thanks, everyone, for being there. Thank you. Thank you.